explain that this program will be mostly one sequence of instructions from start to finish. Can pupils choose a good starting block and a way to welcome users to their quiz? And then have they tested this? And they normally end up coming up with something along these lines. Okay, green flag and welcome to my maths quiz. It's not a bad idea at this point to just sort of make sure that children do know that it is going to be a maths quiz. And if you haven't explained that in the introduction or the section one where you've gone through the algorithm, then that's a good thing to make sure that they realize that. Right, now we're going to introduce the idea of uh, a user putting in some information or inputting in some information into your program. And what we have for this is the sensing block, the ask block. And what this does is allow the user to type something in when this is run. In fact, if I just click this, you'll see that it brings up a little user typing box there. Let's make that full screen so you can see that. And as I type something in there, it's going to go inside this answer block over here. And it's a really good idea at this point to tick this view on stage so that people can see what goes inside there. And in fact, if I type in something, even something really stupid, like fish finger, you can see that fish finger goes in there. And it's really worth laboring the point that actually that, that answer is going in there as well. Uh, at this point, I would normally give the children a bit of time to actually do this and test it and type some things in and just make sure they really understand that that's where their user input is actually going. Technically, this is a variable. <laughs> well, Scratch doesn't call it a variable because it's sort of a variable which gets wiped every time you, you use the ask block over again. And I don't tend to mention that it's a variable to the children either um, because I think it's a little bit confusing. But... Um, it is. Right, so once they've had some time actually going through that, what we're on next is actually introducing the idea of selection. And this is section four in the, um, in the planning. So let's go and what I'd normally do with this is actually go and use some selection examples from the real world. And you can have a look and work your way down the others. But I normally finish on this one. And this is a really good one because we've got if the answer given in class is equals or the same as a good answer, then we've got praise from the teacher. And if it's not, if that condition is not fulfilled, if the answer given in class is not a good answer, then we get no praise from the teacher and we get whatever codes inside there. So we're just relating this new idea of selection about making a choice okay, to... Um, to a real concrete example and then I'd go back to the code and we'll actually just build this up it's a really good idea to, to, to get children to really stop and watch and listen at this point because this is the type of thing that if you miss something you really you know you'll struggle with this so what we've got here is we've got our if and else choice our selection block and we're going to put a condition in here Okay, and what we're going to do is we're going to go back, and it's really nice to relate this to the algorithm they worked earlier, where they had that equals or the same as, where you did that comparison um, in section one. And so you go back and drag this out and talk about the equal sign being uh, relating to your algorithm. And then I quite like the fact that they're the same shape as well, and you can just drag that over and drop that inside there. And now what we've got is if we drag this answer over and just pop it in the front there, we've got if the answer that I first typed in, whatever that was, okay, whatever the user's answer is, is, is the same as something. And of course it's a really good idea to put an actual question in here. Uh, and let's just put that in there. And so we've got our question in there, three times three. And if we were going back to the algorithm, that's our question that we actually first thought of. And we can put our answer, which is the answer we first thought of as well, in there. So now we've got, uh, it's going to ask the question. Okay, and it's going to wait. And then when the user has typed in the answer, it's going to check to see if it's the same as this nine. And if it is the same as this nine, it will run whatever's in the top. And if it's not, it'll run whatever it is in the bottom, the else bit. So now let's drag out some things and put some, some uh, blocks of code to 
um, act on those if or else statements. So let's type in correct and let's type in wrong. Okay, resist the children's temptation to put loser in there. And now I would normally always step this through. I'd go right up to the interactive whiteboard and I'd talk this through step by step and even pretend to be a child typing in the wrong answer. And then check to see, say I've typed in the answer six in here. Okay, so let's actually do that for a second or two. And I do this normally not actually even running the code. So I've typed in six. So six is going to go into this answer here. And then we can check is six the same as nine? No, it's not. So it goes down and just runs that wrong block further underneath there. And let's just try that. And we can see, yes, it does. It only, it's not the same as, okay. Um, at this point, I will be getting the children to go back and make this, okay, and then a lot of them will say, oh, can I do another question? And I'd normally ask them, the normal thing I would say is something along the lines of, well, what two blocks would you not include if you were going to write another question? And if they can come up, they can realize that they don't need this green flag and they don't need the say, then let them, let them go on with it. Now, I actually think it's right, quite a good idea for the children to actually write the first question. And then there is a, a nice little activity in the pupil book where they have to go and match the original algorithm ideas that they thought of with this first question code. And this is quite a good time to get them to go away from the computer for five minutes and go and see if they can match that up. And if you've got any SEM pupils, get them to do it in pairs, work with somebody else, think it through. Okay, it's a really nice thing. It's not a bad little assessment really to, to see if they are, how much they've understood. Um, and there's another little video explaining that. So you're, you're, you're doing this and they're making more questions. It is a really good idea at some point when they're making some more questions to go and show them how to duplicate the question. And you'll notice that you can go to the topmost block that you want and you right click on it and you can duplicate it. Now watch this, and this is a real common error, and I'd nearly always go through this with, with the children. Now, if you just snap that on the end, I've got a new question, and of course I can type in something else. 10 add 10 equals whatever. Okay, and we can put that in there. Now, that's fine, but a lot of times what you find is that children do this. Now, this is a great teaching opportunity because actually you can ask the children, is this wrong? And a lot of them will say yes. And you can say, well, mm, it's not actually wrong. It might not have been what you wanted it to do. Uh, and a good th question to ask them is, when will that 10 add 10 question be run? And they'll often puzzle a bit and give them a bit of time to have a think about this. I often find, you know, the more the more I give them a little bit of time to actually think, the better the answers and the thoughts come out. Now, you will get some children who will say, well, and they've realized that actually you'll only get this second question if you get the first question wrong. Um, and then you can say, well, actually, then wh when might that be a good idea? Um, a good time and often children will come up with something like well if you, you could have an easier question if you if you got the first one wrong um, so that's quite nice that just that they understood that I have had on, on very occasions a child actually choose to put something there and I thought it was a mistake and they've actually figured it out for themselves so it's worth not always assuming that and then it's time just time to give them lots of time to sort of build up their questions um, and make quite a few questions. But we're going to go on to um, question, um, section six, which is about the score variables. There are some other little extensions in the teacher plan, but I'm just gonna do this in a very basic way. So we're looking at the score variables now at this point. And there's a little video to show how I would always model these using pots. Uh, and I would really recommend that you do that before actually going on to this. But let's just go through the actual creation of variables and thinking it through. So here we go. We've got a variable and we click on this and we've got score in here. And we've, we've created our variable. 
and of course you've already demonstrated with pots the idea that the set score 2 always empties the pot out first and then puts whatever pencils you need to make the score okay and the change score variable okay it um, doesn't empty the pot it just adds whatever you've told it to add in there each time I would normally show the children the first set score one and talk about that being a really good place in the first or ask them to come up where the, the best place is and they'll often come up with that and then just drag those out and let them see if they can work out where those variables should go if you if you want to get the answer correct so that you give the person a point only if they get that answer correct um, often children will drag these into the right place they'll often put them um, underneath the correct here not what I've just done but uh, they often put them underneath the correct and that is the right place but there is a slight logical reason that, that actually they're slightly better above and it's quite nice to ask the children to see if they can work out what that is um, and if you were to think about it, um, it if you put it above then you get this very instant change of the score up the top here when you get it right and then your cat is still saying correct and your score's already been changed and of course if it's underneath you've got um, it, the cat is said saying correct for two seconds but you've not got the the point to say that it's correct as well um, so that's really useful and <clears throat> I will do another little video to explain the broadcasts but I hope that's at least given you a starting point um, and along with the written plan which is quite detailed it at least gives you some ways into this. <laughs>